Yeah, for 25 years I've been working in Ladakh uh, in education reforms, experimenting with various things uh, in the textbooks and including the system of education itself. So I'll share a little bit of my learnings from those. Um, if you look at this image, education or schooling as we do is perhaps the single biggest pain that young adults go through in our society today. Now, can we take analogies and learn from nature? That's what I have been trying to do while trying to bring reforms in the education system. Are we doing things in harmony with nature's designs, or are we digressing uh, away from it? If you look at the mouse and the horse, if you could see something that we can learn from, you would know that mice are obnoxious in that they make holes everywhere, in the walls, in the doors. And I used to wonder, why do they do that? Do they really eat wood? No. Then I learned that no, there is a design that nature has for them. It's a very interesting design. Nature, over millennia, has designed or has evolved these creatures to have teeth that will grow as it wears out, that they'll be eating, gnawing at various rough foods and things, and therefore their teeth grow at a very fast rate, non-stop. And if we disrupt that design, then we face the consequences. So away from that design, as these rodents nowadays have uh, more and more softer foods, they have a problem. They have to keep grinding their teeth. So they nibble, so they gnaw at wood, at uh, wires, electric wires, and everything they can find, so as to wear their teeth. Uh, otherwise, what would happen is their teeth grow at an alarming rate of roughly two to three millimeters per week, which would mean over a year, it would be 10 centimeters long this way and that way, and they would all die. So imagine a colony of mice struck a treasure of butter. They're always looking for food, and they would think that would be the best thing to happen. Butter, butter everywhere, nothing but butter. What could be better than that? But no, over a year, they would all die with this kind of phenomena. Similarly, other animals, like horses, are designed beautifully by nature to have shoes that are auto-regenerating. According to the rate of wear, they regenerate, and that's why they don't have to buy shoes forever in their lives. So their own hooves keep growing and growing. But then, in the rare event when a horse is, say, physically challenged, or suppose a horse was treated like a prince and never had to walk or walk, this is what would happen. Their hooves would grow and grow with nothing to wear them and grow this way, completely debilitating. This is nature's design. So my thought, my hypothesis, looking at the education system and the way our young adults behave, are known to behave, you know, young humans are today, teenagers and young adults, have become notorious world over for being a problem, for being rebellious, for causing, you know, problems uh, more than they solve. Could it be, could it be that this is again because of a grand design of nature. Because our industrial civilization, which treats our young ones like princes and princesses and cages them in a classroom and lectures them 
day in, day out for 16 to 18 years in the name of education is but only 200 years or so that we have outsourced all our needs of energy and work to ancient fuels, fossil fuels, uh, and don't do anything anymore. So our young adults get, it, get everything on a platter. The parents who have now only one or two children, nuclear families, dote on them, don't let them do anything, take care of everything. And what results is, perhaps because nature had designed them to be full of energy, to endure and encounter all kinds of challenges in nature. Imagine 200 years of this easy life and 200,000 years of evolution of the human species. So nature has not designed us for these 200 years. It has designed us over 200,000 years at least, if we even think of the current form of human beings. Could it be that our teenagers, just like the others, are designed for facing challenges, taking on problems, taking responsibility, and when all that finishes with the current civilization, when everything is on a platter, then that energy comes out in the form of destructive, often violent uh, forms, manifestations. Could it be that we need to look, relook at this system of upbringing that we give our young ones. Working in Ladakh, I know that young Ladakhis, young adults, teenagers, who come from very remote rural areas where they have to go through all the challenges that perhaps nature designed us for, I have never heard of even or seen teenager problems. They're always taking care of others, taking responsibility, doing things, and never really a problem. They're a partner in running things. So I'll just share some uh, things from Ladakh, just to get to know Ladakh. It's in the Himalayas, or rather Trans-Himalayan, and uh, at 11 to 14,000 feet, uh, people live in a high Himalayan uh, cold desert which, if you look from a distance, does not even look like you know, it would support life. But if you look closer, then there are oases of greenery, and civilization has not only uh, survived, but thrived over the years, despite harsh climate, with temperatures going from minus 35 to plus 35. Yet, as I said, not only have people survived, but a civilization thrived with its own lifestyle, you know, music, uh, farming, and so on. So yes, people here are a tiny microscopic minority in a vast tropical country like India. So they do face a lot of problems. And the least, uh, or the most, would be young people going through the system of education. Not only is it what it is to all the big cities, but add to that that it is very alien to a climate and a context which has very little similarities with the plains. And therefore, although I said young people here are very enthusiastic to learn and very responsible, they used to fail en masse in this system. <clears throat> oh. yeah. So when I was finishing my own mechanical engineering, I had to teach students to earn the expenses for my engineering study. And that's when I came face to face with the system. Perfectly bright students would fail when it came to their examinations of writing answers on paper even if they had all the skills that their life would require, 95% of the students failed every year consistently. And we worked to change that system. And together with the government, we trained the teachers to be more child-friendly and creative. 
We organized the villagers to take ownership of the schools and uh, then change the curriculum, textbooks, and so on. And very soon, the results changed, yes. Uh, over the years, it went up from 5% to uh, 75%. But this also was not, not a very good situation. 25% is still very bad. Even 1% is bad if that 1% happens to be you. So therefore, for those who still failed, we started a very special school which would do things differently, where we could experiment with all these uh, you know, ways of dealing and learning uh, together with young people. It was also an experiment in how human civilization could advance in a way that uh, brings us comfort in life, but does not cost the earth in harmony with nature. So it's a campus where everything is uh, ecologically sound. The whole campus is built with earth or mud, powered by sun, solar energy, with no uh, grid connection at all. And the way the students learn is very different here. It's learning by doing and being there. Actually, the students run the school themselves. They come here and uh, learn from their seniors. And they run the whole school like a little country with a little government that changes every two months. And during the two months, each student is assigned a responsibility by their elected leader. They plan, they execute, they report in the parliament, and learn the life skills that way, skills that they would be needed, uh, they would be in need of when they go to the real world. <clears throat> Similarly, they take care of all things that happen at the campus. Some would take care of uh, the cows and the milk production, solar cooking or organic food, power plants, and greenhouses in the winter. <clears throat> innovations are a part of the campus life, and they are a part of those innovations from scratch. So the school itself is, in fact, designed and built by the students. Uh, the whole school innovations run around the themes of earth, sun, ice, and fire, things that are contextual and needed there. So the whole campus, as I said, is built of earth and is heated by the sun. Very simple principles that you find in high school science is applied, just that, uh, that warm air rises in the greenhouse when the sun heats it, goes into the building through the windows upstairs, and the cold air, because it's heavier, comes down and is pushed into the greenhouse by the warm air coming in a convection cycle. And this cycle continues all day, warms up the walls of the building. And in the evening, when the students responsible for that close the windows, the heat is trapped, and the walls start radiating to the rooms. Now, this is uh, you know, thermodynamics of the simplest form, uh, heat traveling through convection, conduction, radiation, and so on. These are applied in their buildings, and they build the buildings together with others. And that's how they learn basic science in application. When it is contextual, things are hard to forget. When it is out of context, they are hard to remember. So similarly, the sun is used for all other needs, cooking, uh, greenhouses in the middle of winter, giving green vegetables, lighting in the building, uh, electricity, water pumping, and even the cows on the campus live in uh, solar heated cow sheds. So this is how they learn contextual, meaningful things and apply them in life. And of course, this becomes a part of their life. Similarly, ice can be a savior in the mountains where, due to climate change, glaciers are melting away and causing lots of problems. So together with the students, three years ago, we started with a new innovation to freeze the water that goes waste in the streams of Ladakh and goes into the Indus and finally into the Arabian Sea when nobody needs it in winter. But then in spring, everybody, all plants need water 
and there's not enough water in the stream. So there's conflict over water. So we worked on freezing up the water that goes, in, goes waste in winter when it is so cold, and then the ice that would be made could melt in spring when everybody needs water. It was a very simple idea, um, just with a pipe, again, simple high school science or less, uh, a pipe upstream that goes into the stream, and because it is going down the slope in the mountains, it builds pressure in the pipe, and then if you put a fountain at the end of the pipe, it gushes out, sprinkles, and loses its heat, latent heat, to the minus 20 air, falls down, and freezes. Freezes and freezes, and naturally it forms the shape of a cone, which, by the way, is a shape with minimal surface area to the volume of water it contains. Now, because of this shape, while all other ice on the ground would melt by end of February, this cone goes on and on till June and July, slowly releasing it water, its water. <clears throat> yeah. just when farmers and plants need water the most. So it's like storing water in the sky, vertically. And that's possible only in a cold place where water can have this solid phase. And just that a fountain can make it, you don't really have to make it, is almost like 3D printing of a large cone. And a cone that looks like a traditional Ladakhi stupa, therefore we called it an ice stupa, just to make it closer to people so that there could be ownership. So it looks like a stupa in the Himalayas. Um, we even put prayer flags, but they were really meant for me for partial shading of the ice and windbreak, although people take it with some reverence, like a stupa. <coughs> Good. Um, then the villagers got together to plant 5,000 trees uh, as a pilot phase to prove the concept. And ice for young people can be a lot of fun, and young people, as I said, have to be engaged in you know, challenging things. So ice sports are very popular in Ladakh. Um, Ladakh could be called the capital of ice sports in India. Uh, but then until 10 years ago or so, it was limited, restricted to only men, because ice sports were pl played in ponds and reservoirs, which were not conveniently located for uh, women or girls to go. They never figured in this sport. So we said we should change that. And we innovated to make ice rinks anywhere using some reflectors and shading, we were able to make ice rinks right outside the girls' hostel. And over 10 years, we created India's uh, national team for ice hockey, which... <laughs> yeah, which in 2016 went and participated in the Asia Challenge Cup in Taipei. <clears throat> so basically, what we are saying is that education doesn't need to be only restricted to reading, writing, and arithmetic. The three R's, which are all to do with alone. Our young people are full of energy for more than that. Perhaps they are too good to be good for this system. Therefore, it has to involve skills of the hand and kindness of the heart also. And that's how, at this school, we have been experimenting by giving them all the challenges that perhaps we are designed for, and so that they can become a partner in the system rather than a problem. And uh, some of the results of this kind of experiment with the school, um, I'll introduce you to some of the, say, stars in Ladakh, young stars, Tsewang uh, Rigzin, learned, uh, came to this school and became a journalist and later became the education minister of the Ladakh Hill Council at 27. Uh, Stanzin <laughs> went on to become an international filmmaker with many awards in France, Canada, India, 
And Chorol is today a celebrated entrepreneur written about in many international journals. One thing common among them was <clears throat> that they had failed. They had failed not once, but many times. So the question then is, if failures can do what toppers dream of, then you can imagine what everybody could do if the system was more uh, supportive. Therefore, we started working on a much bigger program. And in between, luckily or by design for us, in 2016, the buildings that the students and we built together won the International Terra Award in Lyon, France, and brought us a fair bit of publicity. The iStupa concept won the Rolex Award for Enterprise. Again, it brought us uh, yeah, visibility and a good amount of money, so roughly a crore rupees as award money. So what we have done is to use that and go to the next level of this school. So now what we are working on is to set up a university that would take this concept further, a university where everything would be practical, a doer's university, a maker's university, on a desert, a huge desert, of which 200 acres were given by the government to, for this university recently, uh, using ice stupa, artificial glaciers, to green this desert, and then create a university that would set a new trend, hopefully, in higher education, a vision for a uh, university where the school of business will not be talking of business or reading about them or studying just case studies, but actually doing business or running businesses on campus that actually have uh, revenues and dividends and so on. The school of tourism and hospitality would run high-end uh, hotels and simple homestays and where the students can work and gain experience. And these enterprises would raise the revenues for the university so that the university doesn't have to charge students any fees. That's the idea. So the students don't have to pay in currency of rupees and dollars, but they pay in their creativity, in their sweat equity, and participate in running an enterprise that the university is. The <clears throat> Thank you, thank you. Similarly, the School of Environmental Sciences could be engaged in taking further the artificial glaciers and you know, now with uh, glacial lakes, outburst problems, and solve those problems in real life. And we have started already with greening that desert with ice stupas, as I said, 5,000 trees have been planted. It's no longer just a dream. And we wanted it to be a people's university, which starts with common people, young people, wanting a change in the system, and then goes on to bigger supporters like corporates and governments, but starting with people. And therefore, we launched recently a crowdfunding campaign. And I must share you, with you that when, when, when you want something really changed, as they say, the whole nature conspires to support you. So, a recently, a seventh grade student from Delhi started raising funds, becoming a champion. And a seventh grader raised uh, 35,000 rupees for a university that he would like to see before he grows up. This is like a vote of approval and a felt need that we really like uh, to be in. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.